Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here in the research papers room. In just a minute, we are going to welcome Dan Rosenheck, who's done some great research. And then later in the afternoon, from, from 11.30 to 1, we will have the research paper finals and live judging. That will be the end of the research paper competition sponsored by Major League Baseball. But first, we are very, very happy to welcome back friend of the conference and the economist Dan Rosenheck. Is working? Yep, great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm Dan Rosenhack. I am the data and sports editor of The Economist, um, and indeed a longtime friend of the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. And I will be sharing with you today uh, some research I've done on a uh, hopefully novel approach to calculating win probabilities in the National Football League. So let's get started. Um, this project began uh, a little over a year ago um, with the insane Super Bowl that transpired in January 17 between the Atlanta Falcons and the New England Patriots. Um, as I imagine most all of you were watching, uh, the game looked pretty much over by halftime when Atlanta was up 21 to 3. Uh, they scored another touchdown in the third quarter, uh, putting them up 28 to 3, and they held on to lead 28 to 12 with six minutes to go. Uh, you all know what happened next. Uh, a insane comeback, two two-point conversions, crazy catches, turnovers, you name it, can't even remember. Uh, Patriots came all the way back uh, to tie it in regulation and then won in overtime. Um, and uh, in the wake of this remarkable event, um, the uh, win probability graphs went viral on the internet because they went from the very bottom to the very top in a very small amount of time. Um, this in turn led to lots of debate online about just how improbable or unlikely really was this. Was this the most, the most ridiculous, impossible thing we'd ever seen, or uh, was it merely very, very unlikely? Clearly, uh, betting against Tom Brady in the fourth quarter has generally been a mistake uh, in the past. So um, uh, how do we go about um, assessing, the, evaluating this question? Well, uh, there is no shortage of win probability models for uh, professional football. Uh, ESPN and Pro Football Reference, their models are widely cited. Um, there's also a ton of academic literature on this. Uh, there are random forests, generalized additive models, support vector machines. Uh, if you Google NFL win probability, you'll get a million hits. This is a very, very crowded field uh, that I've decided to wade into. Um, but uh, to answer a question like this about the 2016 Super Bowl, we need to take a different approach. Um, most of the existing models, uh, although they use lots of different fancy pants techniques, they're pretty much doing the same thing. They've got a historical track record of games. They know who won and lost each one. They look at the game state, down, yard line, score, uh, yards to go, um, uh, and time remaining. And they try to essentially ask a computer to predict the result of the game in some way uh, based on that information. Maybe they throw in a Vegas pregame line as well um, to uh, address for team quality. So um, that method is so prevalent because it works really well. Um, when you have events that occur with any half decent frequency, say one in 20, one in 30 times, um, that's going to be pretty reliable. And in fact, um, teams that led by as much as the Falcons did historically had gone on to win 99.8% of the time. However, um, this method uh, can break down when you are trying to assess the probability of extremely unlikely events. So um, uh, I remember right after the game that tweet went out pointing that um, teams trailing by 26 and 23 points with six to nine minutes remaining left in the third quarter uh, had lost all 190 games that they had played. Uh, the, the Patriots victory moved that to one in 191. Um, however, it is worth noting that um, teams that trail by t between 23 and 26 points in the third quarter tend to be rather bad playing against teams that tend to be rather good. Whereas in the Super Bowl, um, you had a, histor a historically great offense against, uh, you know, at best, good, not great uh, defense. So presumably that 0.5% historical record isn't necessarily the best guide. 
So we know that the Patriots' comeback was certainly rare, but there's a huge amount of uncertainty around just exactly how um, unlikely uh, that event might be. Uh, what you see at the bottom left there is just um, uh, a likelihood graph of if we know that we have one example of one, uh, one success in 191 trials, um, and you drew that, uh, that one sample of 191 from some true population, and you wanted to say, so what is, what is the probability that the true frequency of this event in that population is X? Well, as you can see, the top of the graph is right where you would expect, about 0.5%. But you know, there's a chance it could be 0.0001, or it could be as high as 0.03, 0.04. Even if it were a crazy black swan, a 1 in 4,000 thing, you would still expect around 5% of the time in 191 trials that you'd see this happen. Or conversely, even if it wasn't that big of a deal, say like a 1 in 40 thing, um, around 5% of the time in 191 trials, you'd never see it happen more than once. The problem is that unlike other sports, the NFL plays so few games that there's just not enough data for a model that's trained on reality, on what actually happened, um, looking at wins and losses, to give you a reliable estimate for something this unlikely. So what do we do? Let's take a weekend trip to Monte Carlo. Although the real world doesn't give us enough data on wins and losses to answer this question, a computer can help us out. What we can do is simulate the remainder of the game from that state, taking the identities of the teams in question into account a bajillion times, and then um, essentially create enough data out of thin air to try to, um, to come to an estimate of a number that, um, hasn't, uh, that the real world can't provide us. So how do we do this? Well, if, if the problem is that our sample size of games where this has happened isn't big enough, we need a bigger sample. How do we get a bigger sample? By drilling down in the data. So um, if you look at sort of the hierarchy of what comprises these uh, outcomes that, we want, that we're interested in. So games are made up of drives, possessions. And drives are made up of plays. And there are not so many games. There are more drives, and there are even more plays. So we don't have a ton of, ga a ton of games where something like this has happened, but we do have a ton of plays to look at. So let's start at the play level where we do have enough data that we can draw reliable inferences and use that as the basis of our simulation. So um, uh, this isn't necessarily the most comprehensive list of variables. There's probably lots more you could try to add, but this is what I started with. Um, we got yards per play on rushing and passing, both for the uh, accumulated by the offense and allowed by the defense. We've got the coefficient of variation of that. Did those, did those yards tend to be very consistent, or is it a big play offense with a lot of you know, incomplete passes? Um, interception rate, fumble rate, um, move the chains rate. How often do your first downs yield another first down or a touchdown? Uh, net penalty yards, um, red zone performance. What share of the time do you, that you enter the red zone do you get a touchdown? Um, how you've done on special teams yardage, and uh, a few more that I didn't even bother putting on the list. But you can throw as much in the soup as you'd like. The first thing we need to assess is how well a statistic predicts itself. Um, because, so if you take something like, for example, um, third down short yardage conversions, they're really important. And if you know how well a team did on converting third and twos, you're probably going to have a pretty good sense of who won. However, um, uh, performance in these short yardage situations is very, very hard to predict. It's close to random. As you can see on the right-hand side, um, teams that start out the season converting 90% of their third and twos, third and ones, fourth and ones, um, basically wind up doing only average in the second half or even below. Um, so looking how a team did in the past in this is not so helpful a guide to how they'll do in the future. Conversely, other statistics like just the number of yards you get per play tend to be much more robust. Teams that start out doing well in that tend to continue. Now, appearances can be deceiving. Unlike other sports, the NFL has a short, unbalanced schedule. As a result, that leads to wildly different strengths of schedule. Um, so you need to take into account not just how well a team has done, but how strong their opponents were. So here you see another um, split half graph where we compare a team's performance in the first half of the season to the second. And you can see that if you know nothing about um, how good a defense uh, actually is, all you know about is how strong the offenses were that they played against previously you can predict 7% of the variance in the change from their first half to their second half performance. 
then we have to assess which side, the offense or the defense, has more control over um, what's going to happen in a given statistic. Well, that ratio is different for every statistic. For something like uh, fumbles, uh, somewhat intuitively, uh, the defense, which can force them, um, tends to matter a bit more. If you see at the bottom left, those are the standardized coefficients. A bigger number means that variable has more importance. For others, like converting first downs into new first downs, the offense is about twice as important. So what is all this good for? So we go to all this work, and we see, OK, how robust is this variable? How well does it predict itself? Strength of schedule, relative contributions of offense or defense, and what am I going to get? Who committed more fumbles? Is that really so useful? Well, let's get started. This is the first step in a process. The first thing to do is we want to take um, each team's projected performance against a neutral opposition in each variable for both the offense and the defense. Uh, skip through this technical slide. This is how we predict, um, given a team's fast fumble rate, strength of their opponents, et cetera, et cetera, um, how we then convert that into a projection of what their fumble rate would likely to be likely to be going forward in, in neutral conditions. Uh, I'll put this online. Um, once we have those predictions, we can then take um, every variable on every play, use those predictions, and put them in a big soup to ask a computer, OK, what's going to be the outcome of this drive based on all these predictions for each variable at the play level? Um, I tried it with a simple multinomial logistic regression, and it was very ugly. Um, I took one look at that and decided I needed a new approach. It also wasn't that helpful. So if you look at just which of these variables winds up predicting drive outcomes, so these are your standardized coefficients for the impact of a touchdown, okay, so sure, if you're closer to the goal, you're probably more likely to get a touchdown. If you're on fourth down, you're probably less likely. But the game situation so dominates that the impact of the actual team quality variables is a little hard to assess. Moreover, um, this would be assuming a steady impact for each variable in each situation. And, pr and clearly, that's not the case. Obviously, getting you know, a steady stream of first downs helps a lot more when you're in your, on your own 20 than on the opposing 20. So um, we needed to bring a little more muscle to this. In a certain complex like football, nonlinearities, interactions, um, we want to use something more like a machine learning approach. I tried a few methods, random forest, et cetera. I wound up settling on something called an elastic net, which is basically a regression, but it's a pretty fancy one. You throw in a ton of variables, interactions, transformations, and then you apply a penalty that says, OK, each variable that we're going to add to this it makes it more complex. We want to minimize complexity, so we're going to penalize that. And then you just let the computer tell you, OK, so what combination of all these transform transformed variables gives you the best result? Did it work? Uh, at the drive level, it performed impressively well. I trained both my predictions for each individual statistic and then the drive results based on those predictions on the 2014 to 16 seasons and then tested them on 2017. So this is um, a purely out of sample test. As you can see, it got the touchdown frequency almost perfect. It got field goal, fre attempt, field goal attempt frequency almost perfect, punt frequency almost perfect. Turnover frequency pretty close to perfect, except at the very, very high end. Even rare rounds, the odds of um, a failed fourth down conversion or even a safety, it gets these frequencies pretty much right. So even then, now we can say, how do we, uh, we, we've got drive level uh, forecast. How does that add up into a game result? So um, the first thing is to see what, uh, now that we've built this fancy model, how does each variable really wind up affecting um, uh, the result of the drive and therefore the result of the game? So uh, to answer this, I conducted a little experiment. I took completely neutral situation, 50-yard line, first and 10, team playing at home, two teams that are exactly average in every statistic. And then for each variable, I subbed in the best and worst prediction for that variable in my data set and subtracted the difference and measured it in expected points. And here is the resulting chart. So for offenses, uh, the single most important statistic is converting first downs into future first downs. For defenses, it's straight yards per play. That suggests that, offense, that although both sides can vary their tactics, depending on yards to go, offenses do so a bit more effectively. Um, 
there, you hear a lot about teams that either you know choke or you know bunker down in the red zone. Once you know how good they are in general, that doesn't seem to be that predictive, and um, it doesn't look like offenses um, that avoid have a, that avoid fumbles necessarily wind up outperforming significantly. So, what does this all add up to? Here, we take our drive model, and we just to give you guys a sense of what these drive level predictions look like. I've got here. Uh, 12 different situations um, of what the model would predict if these two teams were to play each other. The best offense in my data set, the 2016 Falcons of the Super Bowl. The worst offense in my data set, the 2016 Rams. The best defense in the data set, the 2015 um, Broncos. And the worst defense in the data set, the 2015 Saints. And then each of these pairings at the 10, the 50, and the 90, uh, or the, the opposing 10, under normal game conditions. As you can see, the order is pretty much what you would expect. Best offense against the worst defense at its 90, 70% touchdown, 30% field goal. Worst offense against best defense at the 10, about 50% um, uh, punt and 20% um, uh, turnover. Um, and everything sort of scales through uh, as you change these three variables. One interesting thing to note is that as you can see, this chart makes it appear that, con that contrary to the um, cliche that defense wins championships, it looks like offense matters a little more than the defense does. If you see a great offense against a great defense scores a few more points than, a great, um, than, a, uh, than, the, than the inverse. Now, here's the same chart, but in a specific game state, which is what if the offensive team needs a touchdown? They're trailing by four or more with less than two minutes left, or 12 or more with less than five minutes left. Well, as you can see, under those situations, all the punts go away, all the field goals go away, and you have a bunch of green and a bunch of red. So everybody's touchdown odds go up because they're going for it and fourth down all the time, but you also see a lot more turnovers, a ton of turnovers on downs, particularly from um, weak offenses deep in their own zone, and even a, a hefty chance of a safety in some cases. So. Now we have drive predictions. How does this turn into a game? Well, um, I'm going to make one very tenuous and probably wrong assumption on which this entire project depends, which is that um, each drive by the same team in the same game is identically and independently distributed from every other one. Now, in fact, this is probably wrong. Anybody who watches football knows that um, between possessions and certainly at halftime, each team tries to read the other side's schemes, come up with something new. There's a game theory back and forth, trading strategies. Each team secures a temporary advantage until the other side figures them out. That should lead to some sort of sine curve periodicity on which team has the edge at any given moment. Um, I haven't modeled that. I hope it evens out. <laughs> so. How do we stick these progressions together into a prediction? Well, um, uh, I forecast all the special team stuff to get um, where uh, the, each team will start the ball on each possession. I then um, used a great package in the R language, if anybody knows it, called GAM LSS, that instead of giving you just a point prediction, gives you the parameters for a whole distribution that you can then draw from. So. Um, I, for each situation, conditional on the simulated drive result, I say, OK, what's the distribution of how much time this would have taken off the clock and where the other team would be likely to start the next drive? Now we can simulate. So this is a four-step process. First, we pick a result from the drive distribution. Then, using that result for the drive, we say, OK, given that this was a field goal attempt, um, now we predict, given that, um, what's the distribution of how much time it would have taken off the clock and where the next team would have started their drive. And then we draw random numbers from those distributions, subtract the resulting time off the clock, move the yard line, add to the score, and then we do this every possession until the game is over, and then again 10,000 times. So, with eight minutes and 31 seconds left in the third quarter of Super Bowl 51, the Falcons scored another touchdown to bring them to 28-3. If you go to profootballreference.com, they had a 99.8% chance to win, 1 in 500. When we simulate the remainder of the game 10,000 times, we get 97.5%. Um, so clearly, uh, the Falcons were, of course, overwhelmingly favored 
but the Patriots were actually live. And if a betting market was offering you, you know, 500 to 1, 1,000 to 1 on that, at, you know, at that moment in time, that's an easy, uh, you know, easy buy. You know, 2.5% is 1 in 40. 1 in 40 events happen all the time. I was actually quite surprised that it came in as high as it did. And, you know, largely that's because uh, the simulation, unlike, uh, you know, most of these models, knows that uh, the Patriots are really, really good at offense and, um, you know, they can move down the field quickly. So, um, one final uh, point before, before questions. What actually happened was the game went to overtime, um, the Patriots won the toss, marched down the field, scored a touchdown, and that was it. Uh, I thought that was a little unfair. So, what if we entered a parallel universe with overtime rules that made a bit, it made a bit more sense, where um, the team that doesn't get the ball first actually has the chance to score up themselves um, uh, if the other team scores a touchdown in the first possession of overtime? Well, I've simulated that too, 10,000 times. And um, had the Patriots been allowed to get the ball back, trailing by seven uh, in overtime, where uh, whoever's leading at the end of a pair of possessions wins, um, they probably would have come back to win about 20% of the time. Um, that's eight times more likely than the Patriots' chances were of getting to that, of, of, of winning the game in the first time, in the first place. So um, clearly, that suggests that the impact of winning the coin toss is absolutely enormous. If I simulate the overtime 10,000 times with one side versus the other winning the toss, it changes the win probability by 16 percentage points. That's the same as basically starting the game with a six-point lead. So I will end this presentation um, with a clarion call to action. Um, the NFL's overtime rules are a travesty. They need to be changed. They need to be changed now. Uh, who's with me? Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. So we do have time for just a couple questions. So raise your hand, and we will try to come find you with the mics. Um, I think a common theory through this game was that what happened in the fourth quarter was that Atlanta's defense was fatigued. Did your simulation somehow account for something I'm sorry, like I, didn't, I didn't actually hear you. I thought a common theory th throughout this game was that in the fourth quarter, Atlanta's defense was fatigued and therefore played worse. Did your simulation somehow account for the possibility of something like that? No, that's actually getting to um, what I said was a flawed and probably wrong assumption in the model. You know, reality is always more complicated than your model. So as I said, this is taking all drives as IID. The Atlanta defense is as good as it is with the characteristics it has. Now, you could b bake in, um, is there some steady decline in defensive performance over the course of a game? Does it depend on the number of possessions? Is it team specific? Maybe I'll get to that next year. No, I don't have that. Sorry. OK, we can take one more. Yeah, my, my question was, did you see how your uh, model performed uh, in, the, in any out sample data or other games? And how did it perform versus like tra traditional um, game winning chance models? Yeah, um, so that's a little tough. I mean, I can do that. I haven't done it yet. And the reason why is that the simulations take time. And um, you know, you got to run it 10,000 times after uh, basically every play. Um, and honestly, I finished coding this two days, uh, really, last night. <laughs> um, uh, I will. Um, uh, I will benchmark it against both um, uh, existing models and betting markets and get back to you. Um, certainly betting markets have information that my model doesn't on injury and stuff like that. This only works at the team level. It wouldn't surprise me if this did you know, worse than models that you know, have information that this doesn't. But what this can do that other models can't is it can, it can um, measure the width of those tail events that don't happen in real life. Um, but that is on my to-do list, and I'm sorry I don't have it for you right now. Okay, everyone, please join me in thanking Dan Rosenheck. <laughs> <laughs>